was at the football game on Friday night, and I must have had two dozen different people come up to me, and they were just absolutely giddy that a storm was coming, and they didn't have to do anything on Saturday. <laughs> Maybe you could relate to that, but how, me- I mean, is that red flag about how we need a reset? Is we would rather have a tropical storm come, <laughs> potentially knock out powers and tree that than to actually have to do the stuff that we had planned on Saturday. Dang, I think we need a break. We need a reset. <laughs> Boy, this, uh, this has been a week, week for me. I had, you know, sometimes when you know you need a reset or you know that things, you just need to sort of double down your relationship with God, whatever that looks like for you, sometimes it's a triggering event. And I had one this week. I was in a car accident on Monday. And that's the, uh, the back, which doesn't look so bad, thank God. Um, it, everybody walked away from the accident, but I was stopped at a crosswalk, and a woman in a stroller was about to cross. And about three, four seconds later, someone hit as hard as I've ever been hit in a car, probably doing about 35, ran right into the back. The entire front of his pickup truck was completely crushed, like a, like a tin can. And thankfully, we all walked away, and... Just as a precaution, uh, you know, it, it tweaked my back when I kind of whiplashed forward. And just as a precaution, I, you, you know, they suggested to take an ambulance and, you know, get checked out. The funny thing is about that when you're a pastor in the area is you tend to know people. The first aid responder who came to see me is like, oh, Pastor Jason comes to the church. Oh, Pastor Jason, I wasn't expecting to see you today. <laughs> I said, yeah, I kind of wasn't either, you know, it's. I didn't plan it. Um, And then also the ambulance driver, member of Tower Hill. I'm like, awesome. This is just what I want everybody to know (laughs) that I'm going to the hospital. But uh, it was fine. Although I'll tell you, in the ambulance ride, a very bumpy ambulance ride, it makes you think about a lot of things. Moments like that, you know, thank God it wasn't worse. But it makes you think about a lot of things. And none of them had to do with my schedule. With all the things that I had to get done, I didn't give a single thought to those things. I was thinking about, thank God that that woman didn't start crossing. Her and her stroller. She would have been hit. Thank God I wasn't in our other car that is much smaller, that probably would have suffered a ton of damage. Thank God that my family wasn't in the car. It was just me. You start thinking about all these things. You know what you think about? You think about what really matters most right now. That's what you think about. What really matters most. And it was a reminder to me that I can't put off what really matters. There's a a line from the, the musical, The Music Man. It says, if you pile up enough tomorrows, you end up with a lot of empty yesterdays. Don't put off tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. I'll get after it tomorrow. None of us know how long we have on this planet. Let's not waste another minute putting off the things that matter most today. The stuff on your schedule, that can wait. Don't put off what matters most. That was what I was feeling God telling me. And perfect timing in this service. I didn't ask for a sermon illustration like that. But it kind of works. And the question we've been asking, of course, all along about this pace that we're living at is, what is this doing to me? What is this doing to me? If you're just joining us today, we're just talking a lot about how we have it in our heads that if we just get more done in less time, we're somehow crushing it, killing it, it's productive. When in fact, oftentimes, it's not even all that productive. Is if we we had less to do, we could do those things better. It would be a lot more productive. It's just distance over time equals busy. And what is that doing to us? Who are we becoming as a result? And the promise of Jesus is to give us rest. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. That's what we're talking about in this series. How do we cultivate a soul-level rest in a world that's constantly demanding our time. 
the book that I shared a couple weeks ago, John Mark Comer's The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, which is a great read if you're looking for something to help spark your, your rest time or your reset with God. He asked the question, who am I becoming? And the way we've been framing it is, how does that relate to the next question of who has God called and created me to be? Usually there's a gap between those two things. Who am I becoming and who has God called me to be? Spiritual formation is the process of allowing God to narrow that gap. For you to be in alignment with what he wants for your life, for your relationships, for your job, for your everything. God has a plan and purpose for you. He wants to give you hope. He wants to give you life and that to the full. John 10.10. 10. He wants you to experience all the things that he has created to experience. Most of all, his love, his rest, his peace. He wants you living a better way than this constant, frenetic, disjointed, fragmented way. Doesn't mean you can't still have a lot to do, but I think it's the you that you bring to your situations that matters, right? God wants to change the you that, that you bring to your circumstances. I probably still would have had, you know, I mean, I could have prayed harder. I think that car accident was going to happen either way. I, I'm not fatalist, but I just think, like, that was just part of how my day was supposed to happen. But, but the me that I brought into that accident was impacted by my relationship with God. So I was able to ask questions like, what really matters most? So narrowing the gap, spiritual formation. I want to share another book with you that I'm going to lean on for this uh, sermon a little bit because I love how he phrased some things. Dallas Willard, very famous theologian, now he passed away a couple years ago, who uh, wrote this book, Renovation of the Heart, which is, I feel like it's a pretty accessible book. It's, it is definitely like a theological book, but I think it's something that would help you in your walk. So I want to encourage you to go out and take a look at that. But he says, spiritual formation is like learning a new language. Like you really want to get grow Close that gap between who you're becoming and who God created you to be. you got to think about like you're learning a language. He said, he said it's like first thing you need is a vision. A vision that the benefits of learning are worth the investment it's going to take. And he says that's kind of the problem with high school kids in America. I know it's been a problem with the high schoolers in my house. They do not have a vision for how their foreign language requirement is going to help them in their life. Therefore... They really don't learn it, and it doesn't stick, because they don't have a vision about how it's going to actually help them. This is true with me, dude. Four years of Spanish. Actually, six years of Spanish. All I can remember is how to ask where the bathroom is. <laughs> because I didn't have a vision for it. Listen, we all, in spiritual formation, you all have to have a vision that what God wants for you is better than what you want for you. What God wants for you is better than what the world says it has for you. That God's vision is better. Living the way God wants you to live is going to be better. You have to have a vision for that. That your investment in your relationship with God is going to pay you dividends. It's going to matter. It's going to help you and it's going to benefit in your life. But it's not enough to just have a vision. Well, he even says, he's like, that's why many, you know, talk about teenagers. Teenagers all over the world learn English because they can see the investment in learning English is going to pay off. They're going to need to know that. So they study it, they learn it, they learn it fast. But you don't just need a vision, you also need intention. Because personal transformation rarely happens by accident. You know, wake up one day, you're like, oh yeah, you know, I woke up and I had abs. <laughs> what the heck? How'd that happen? That was awesome, right? Like, <laughs> it's not just how you don't just drift into it. You've got to be intentional about being healthy. You, you don't drift into health. That never happens. I accidentally was able to run a mile, you know, 10 miles or whatever it is. It's all by intention. So you have a vision for it. So now you got to be intentional about it. I have to actually think about how am I going to invest my time in accomplishing this vision. And then third, you need a means need a means of learning. Am I going to do Duolingo? Am I going to do Babel? I'm going to get a class or whatever. You need a means of doing it. This is so true in our spiritual formation. We need a means. How are we going to do it? Well, I'm going to have 10 minutes a day of just 
I'm going to read the Bible, or I'm going to read a devotional, I'm going to use the YouVersion app, I'm going to join a small group, I'm going to do something, I'm going to have a means where I could use my intention to receive the vision that God has for me, to receive what God wants to give me. Vision, intention, and means. And remember the goal. The goal of this is to give you rest for your souls. The more and more we come back into alignment with who we're becoming and who God created us to be, the more we find rest. I know that sounds really weird and counterintuitive, but it's true. You find rest the more you are becoming the person God wants you to be. I don't mean that you're going to necessarily not be busy or have circumstances in your life that are crazy. It just means the you that's brought to those circumstances has been transformed by God. You can experience rest in the storm, like the eye of a hurricane. I always imagine that I'm out in a boat in the middle of it and the storm's raging all around me. The storm's still there, but I could still be at peace because of the God who is inside me, Jesus Christ, by his Holy Spirit. The goal of a reset, according to Jesus, is to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and love our neighbors as ourselves. That's what he said. Like, that's the goal. That's what we want. If we shoot for that, if we're able to love God with everything we are, and love others the same way, you will find rest for your souls. You will have achieved a reset. You will be in alignment with who you were meant to be. So last week, we talk, uh, talked about the heart. Today, we're going to talk a bit about the mind. I do want to say this, that although I'm going to give you kind of some steps and things, the first step, if you want to love God with your whole mind, or love God in any other way, is to ask God. Step zero in all of this is, God, help me love you with all of my heart and soul and mind, and love my neighbor as myself, because I'm not naturally inclined to do that well. I need your help to do it. But what do we mean when we talk about the mind? Sometimes I just like to unpack that. It's like when we talked about the heart. Well, what exactly are we talking about? What do we mean when we're talking about the mind? Well, on a basic level, it's certainly about knowledge. It's about knowing when we love God with our mind. It's certainly on some level about knowing God. This is the amazing thing that Jesus said, is that in John 14, 7, if you really know me... You will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. God, our God, made himself knowable. Because this is the big critique of Christianity. You've heard, seen this old religious parable before about the blind man around the elephant, blind men around the elephant. And the idea is they're all touching a different part of the elephant, and they're describing the elephant in very different ways. If your hand is on the tusk, you're describing it much differently than if your hand is on the coarse skin or on the ear. And the idea is, well, we're all touching the same God, but we can't see the whole thing because ultimately God is not knowable. Who are we as finite human beings with finite brains to claim that we know God? Which, fair point. We can't unless God made himself knowable on purpose. Which is what he did in Jesus. This is the big difference with Christianity. Christianity, we believe God is knowable because he made himself known. He revealed himself through Jesus Christ. And if we look at Jesus and we get to know Jesus, we can know God. Which is a wild concept. We can know how God thinks. We can know what God wants. More on that in a little bit. And that actually God is in the business of opening the eyes of the blind so they can know him as well. So, in a way, it's about knowing God. In another way, it's kind of just about how do we think and process the world. That's loving God with our minds. So, what are our thoughts? All of the ways in which we are conscious of things. And I think it starts on a first level with information. I think to love God with all of our minds is to receive new information that changes how we think, how we behave, that reframes our lives. 
Think about it. If John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1, 14. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. What are they talking about, this Word? What is a Word but something that must be processed in the mind? I think God wants to give us new information. Information about our lives, about the truth, so that the truth can set us free. Because we all are living our lives at least in part, by some bad information that we've received. Not all information is equal. And I think loving God with our minds is trusting that I need to receive God's word so I can see how my life is supposed to be. Because what happens is the information leads to ideas, and the ideas leads to behavior. Here's what I mean. When I get new information, it changes my mind, oftentimes. Maybe it's through a teaching or a learning, or maybe it's just through life. Here's an example. I was going to pick on some local teams, but I thought I'd just keep it to myself. There's plenty to pick on with the Las Vegas Raiders. But let me give you some, uh, an idea of what I'm talking about. So, 2021, the Raiders go through a heck of a crazy season. Their head coach gets fired. Their top wide receiver's in prison. It's not good. And they end up 10-7, and seven, one bad call away from beating the Bengals in Cincinnati. Nobody remembers because no one remembers bad calls. They just remember. Anyway. <laughs> I digress. So they make the playoffs. And the, the Bengals that year went on to the Super Bowl. So, I mean, they were really, really good. So I'm thinking 2022, same team. In fact, better because they upgraded in the draft. What, what are my expectations? What am I thinking about the information? I'm thinking they're going to be a playoff team. They may even go deep into the playoffs. Nope. 2022, 6 and 11. I no longer think or thought they were a playoff team because I got new information. What bad information or misinformation are we basing our lives on still? And then what's that doing to us by trusting that Bad information. See, I think God wants to give me new information that reframes my life. That new information coming from the word himself, Jesus Christ. He wants to tell me the truth about me, about my life, about my purpose, about my calling. He wants to tell me the truth so that I could take that information and use it properly. The other way in this, this works is about information is we use that information to create stories. Our brains are all wired for stories. In fact, we will do anything to finish a story. We hate unfinished stories. That's why uh, we binge watch. We hate unfinished stories. Your brain, did you know just the neuroscience of this, your brain rewards you chemically every time you complete a story. It's kind of like when you have a jigsaw puzzle and you put in the last piece or you find a piece. Your brain rewards you with oxytocin. It's like, yeah, we like completion. <laughs> we like completing things. And so we all have stories, and this is uh, brought up in Brene Brown's book, Rising Strong. We all have stories that we hold as true. And the way we frame our lives is based on how we see these stories. Here's the problem. The power of story, it like, doesn't matter if the story is true or not. In the absence of information... We make up our own story because our brains are always trying to complete the loop. Here's what I mean. Let's say I come to work and someone who works here hates me or doesn't like me or isn't mad at me, which is ridiculous. They all love me. <laughs> so, they, <laughs> let's call him Bob. Sorry, any Bobs out here. It was just the first name. That, let's say I, I come in, I say hi, good morning to everyone, right? And Bob's like giving me the stink eye. He doesn't say good morning. He's like looking at me funny. I'm like, what the heck? I don't say anything. I do what a normal person does. I just go stew on it all day. <laughs> so I go, and I'm thinking about, and, I, and what my brain's doing is coming up with, why is Bob mad at me? And I start thinking of reasons Bob might be mad at me. And then I'm getting adversarial toward Bob getting mad at me about things that I'm making up. And now I have an impression of Bob. Bob's got to go. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. I don't know. So, so the next day, I go in to say good morning again. 
There's Bob. Bob's like, hey, how's it going? Good to see you, Jason. I'm like, what? Go to Bob. Bob, um, can I just ask you, what was up with yesterday? He's like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, you know, I was saying good morning and stuff, and he kind of gave me a sideways look, and he's like, oh, yeah, I, I had this thing in my eye all morning. It was driving me crazy. I'm so sorry. I just, like, was preoccupied with that. Sorry, Bob. <laughs> I know you never do this, but our brains have a tendency in the absence of information to fill it with our own version of the story just because we want the story completed. We don't like the story being unfinished. You can see my point in this. How many bad stories are driving our behavior? And what's the story God wants to renew in your mind so that you can live accordingly? What's that old saying? Henry Ford apparently said this, although I've seen it attributed to like Confucius, so I have no idea if he said it. Those who think they can and those who think they can't are usually both right. The power of the mind. The mind's the gateway kind of to everything else. Exactly. <laughs> there was a study that I was reading about that Stanford did, which is uh, really awesome. It was in the uh, publication of Internal Medicine. It said researchers found that labeling vegetables with indulgent descriptions led to healthier eating. Talk about a brain trick. So I guess they set up a bunch of scenarios, and they had like, on a menu, they had just like green beans and shallots. And then they kind of kept adding things to it. And then they tried different things, like a health negative, they called it, and a health positive, and then indulgent. The health positive one, second place, read something like light and low-carb green beans and shallots. They didn't eat them as much as they ate. The same exact dish, sweet sizzling green beans and crispy shallots. Why? Because our minds like that story better. The power of the mind dictates behavior. Here's what I think. I think God wants to give me a healthier life through true information, his word, that changes my behavior. So, information then leads to what? It leads to ideas. And ideas lead to behavior. So however the story is in your head, or however the information is in your head, whatever idea you have, that will turn into your behavior. And in Colossians, he says it this way, Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. In other words, you have the right information now. You have the right ideas now. So don't go back to the lying that was based on bad information. You're a new person now. You have been reframed, renewed. You're not that person anymore. Therefore, move forward accordingly. Dallas Willard, in his books, put it this way. He said, when Satan undertook to draw Eve away from God, he did not hit her with a stick, but with an idea that God could not be trusted and that she must act on her own to secure her own well-being. What was the tree in offense? The tree of the what? Knowledge of good and evil. The mind's the gateway to our behavior. Information leads to ideas, leads to action. So are we filling ourselves with the right information? Our sin-broken minds need a reset from God through true information and God-shaped ideas about who we are and who we're called to be. One of my favorite verses in all of scripture, Romans 12, 2, puts it this way. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Can we just camp out on the promise? The thing I get asked the most is, Pastor, I don't know what God wants from me. What does God want for my life? What should I do? In other words, what's God's will and how do I know what it is? Guess what? You can know. He doesn't want it to be a mystery to you. By not conforming to the pattern of this world and being renewed in your mind, you will know what God's will is. You will know what God wants. Now, it's not like he prints out a report and it's like, this is every day and every month and every year of what I want. 
That's not how it works. But he will tell you now what he wants from you now. He doesn't want that to be a mystery. He wants you to know. Remember, God made himself knowable. He wants to be known. And he wants you to trust that he's going to give you everything that you need when you need it. It happens through a renewing of your mind. So how does that work? Again, like I said, step zero, praying for God to renew your mind. It's a supernatural thing. It's not just something that we will to happen. It's not like getting abs, thank God. He's providing us what we need. We just have to be open-handed about receiving it. So here are just some practical things that help me when it comes to just renewing the mind. How do I do this in my life? How does it land in my everyday life? The first thing is this. Soak your mind in the right things. It's like French press coffee. Your mind is constantly steeping in something. Is it the right things or the wrong things? It's the whole garbage in, garbage out. During the pandemic, I really stopped watching the news. I, I haven't really picked that up again. Because I just couldn't steep in that anymore. It was having an impact on my life, on my heart. It was having an impact on who I was. I was letting my mind soak in the wrong things. Well, how do I let it soak in the right things? I mean, listen, you could binge watch Dexter. I'm sure it's a fun show. But like over time, that may have an effect on your behavior. I'm not going to say you're going to turn into a psychopath or anything, but you may be a little down. I have a family member who's really into like murder, mystery, true story, crime shows. Like really into them. Watches them a lot. And she wonders why she's kind of paranoid and depressed. I'm like, <laughs> like, so how do we soak our minds in the right things? Well, I love how Philippians 4, 8 puts it. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. It's the whole garbage in, garbage out. I'm not saying you can't watch Dexter. You do you, okay? But I'm just saying, if you're not intentional, again, remember, vision intention means you're not intentional about soaking your mind in the right things, you might not. And that will turn into ideas that turns into behavior. It really will. It shows up in your life. You know, like, if you let your kids on the device too long, even though it's way easier and you just wish you could, their behavior is affected. Same thing. Same thing with us. Soak your mind in the right things. Maybe that means you need to be around people in your life that are going to build you up and not tear you down. I always say, we're supposed to have non-believing friends, all of us. We're all supposed to. We're supposed to just be friends with people. That's good. But we also need some intentional Christian friends that can help lift us up. We all absolutely need that. We just can't do it on our own for very long. Things just get hard very fast. Soak your mind in the right things. The second, and this is really helpful, has been helpful to me, stop the wrong things from turning into ideas. You know what I mean? You get those thoughts and you're like, that's not, that's not a good one. There's a, a scripture I'm taking this out of context a little bit, but I found it to be a helpful principle in my life to practically think about how do I stop the wrong ideas from turning into wrong uh, behavior. And it's from 2 Corinthians 10, it says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. It's kind of about what I'm talking about, but kind of about something, I have to read it in context. But this idea of taking thoughts captive has been really helpful for me. So if I get a thought, maybe it's a negative thought about myself. We all get imposter syndrome sometimes in our lives. Who am I to do X, Y, Z? It's usually something good, and it tries to stop us. Or maybe you get a thought, and you're like, yeah, that's, that's not good for my marriage. That's not good for whatever, my job, my kids. Take that thought captive. Here's what I mean. 
Just acknowledge it. Okay, I mean, this is what I do. I get a thought like that. I'm like, all right, God, I can't control what thoughts like I just randomly have, but I can control what I do with those thoughts. So God, I, I just give this thought to you. I know it's not a thought that you want me to have. I pray that you just erase it. Help me move on. That's what I mean, taking thoughts captive. I think it's a helpful way, whatever that looks like for you, find a way to just be present to those thoughts. Don't let them just wash over you and for it to affect you without thinking about it. That's something that works for me. Maybe it'll work for you. And then third, focus on the vision, intention, and means. Focus on those things. Focus on what does God really want for my life? If you're not excited by your answer to that question, you need to keep asking it. Because God has so much for you. He loves you so deeply. He wants to fill you with joy. He has a purpose for you. There are people that you are meant to bump into in your life that he's placed you on this earth to do, to share his love with. Your unique circle of life has a purpose to it. If you let it. If you let it. Focus on the vision. And then focus on being intentional. Okay, I've been saying for years, I want to come back to God. I want to grow closer in my faith. We've all been there. I'm not going to put off another day what matters most. Because I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. And then the means. Okay, maybe I'm going to join a small group. A Bible study. Prayer time, whatever, to make sure that I am moving forward. <coughs> And then, what is the point of moving forward? I think here's the posture of how we should be. It's, it's the posture that Jesus had. Philippians 2. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. This is amazing, too. If you read the New Testament, you see things all the time about how we have the mind of Christ. Those who put their faith in Jesus, we have the mind of Christ. Which means, we can know what God thinks. We can know what God wants. That's back to the renewing of the mind. We can actually have a similar mind because we have the mind of Christ dwelling in us through faith. I know, that's like, I'll take a while to process that one. But it says, in your relationships, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. I think this speaks to the sort of posture we're to have with the renewing of our minds. And actually our posture with everything. Is we need to empty ourselves and be like, God, what do you want? I want what you want. And if I don't really want it yet, I pray that you help me want what you want. It's open-handed. How could you be full of the Holy Spirit if you're full of yourself? It's an emptying out to say, God, I just want what you want. And to trust that he's going to fill you with everything that you need. And I know there's fear. It's like, well, what if what God wants is totally against what I've been working for? That's hardly ever what happens. So don't let that scare you off. Trust, open-handed. Hey, God, what do you want from me? Christ, who laid himself low, was raised up above all. The Lord will raise you up, too, in your humility. And remember this. Give yourself some grace. You don't climb up mountaintops with leaps. You do it in small, intentional steps. Everyone's like, I want a mountaintop experience with God. You know, that feeling that God's so present and real and I'm excited and joyful. That's awesome, but it's not going to happen overnight. Usually, yeah, but you can. God can do anything he wants. But usually it's in the small intentional steps. Again, you're not waking up with abs the next day. Some of you with abs are like, pick something else. <laughs> Sorry. And it's both active and reactive. Once you start going, God's going to direct you. It's like sailing a boat. Right? First, you've got to untie from the dock, so you're not going to go anywhere. Raise the sail, and the wind's going to push you accordingly. So it steps by you, but then God's also going to respond with other things. And you're going to go, and he's going to take you exactly where you need to be. We want to live under this new equation that God over time equals rest. 
And here's the thing. A rested mind is a mind that knows God's will. Think about that. Think about your life and the times that you felt. Maybe you've had times where you felt you knew exactly where God wanted you to be right now. Nothing feels more restful than knowing exactly where you're supposed to be. A rested mind is a mind that knows God's will. So, are you open-minded to God? Like the palm of your hand, is it open to receive the new information? To be renewed so that you can know his will? The good news is, all of us are capable of doing it. Because we're not capable. Because God does it for us, we just have to ask. I couldn't help this week, it was kind of a, it was a week. Uh, the 20th would, would have been my mom's 74th birthday. And I couldn't believe that she's been gone for 24 years. It's just amazing it's been that long. Um, she made up her mind about God early in her life. This is, her, this is Katie. She made up her mind early in her life, years before, that she wasn't a Christian, that she wasn't into Christianity. She had some bad experiences. And she had a tough life. She had a really tough life. And I wish that she would have had the soul-level rest of God in her to deal with those things. Two failed marriages, you know, drug-dependent men, um, bad stuff. I wish she would have had God in her to help her through it. But then she did. Years later, she decided to be open-minded. And she received Jesus, and it changed everything. It didn't make her less sick, but it made her whole. It gave her rest better than she had when she was healthy. I saw it with my own eyes. So I just want to ask you, as I ask myself, what really matters most right now? Don't put off what really matters another day. Isn't it time for a reset? I think so. Amen.